Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. This is the Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, Lance Peterson. So today I have with me Haley Gant with Quest Trust Company based in Houston, Texas. How are you doing today, Haley? I'm great. I'm happy to be here with you. Yeah, very good. You are, you're in the Houston office, right? I am, yes. So you guys have a location in Dallas as well? or mm -hmm, We do, yeah. So Houston is our corporate office, but we do have uh, fully functional offices in both Dallas and Austin as well. Very good. So how did you end up getting to Quest Trust? Like what, what does one, what, what are the requirements for, you know, getting a job at Quest Trust, um, you know, as sort of a, a self-directed IRA custodian, you know, what, what brought you to Quest Trust? Yeah, so it's actually kind of a funny story. So I, I actually grew up around real estate investing pretty much my entire life here in Houston. Uh, my parents have been investors since I was in kindergarten. Um, so long time ago now, but they have actually held their IRAs at Quest since Quest started as an interest franchise back in the day, back in 2004. So I grew up around kind of all things real estate investing, hard money lending. I was an only child, so I had no choice but to grow up surrounded by everything. Mm -hmm. And once I got out of college, I actually got recruited to work for Quest to come join our marketing department. Um, I became an IRA specialist a few months after that. And here coming up in a couple of weeks, I'm actually about to have my five-year anniversary of working at Quest. So in that time, I've worked in Houston, I've worked in Dallas, now I'm back in Houston. And it's been really fun to kind of come into my niche of, you know, I re I'm really passionate about teaching investors about self-directed IRAs. I like to do a lot of our education, you know, kind of webinars and podcasts like this. So it's really been fun to apply the knowledge that I've had from real estate growing up my entire life. Now I can apply that to IRAs and help teach people about things that will ultimately help them build more wealth. Yeah, definitely. So with that said, since you spend, you know, most of your days doing that education. I mean, what do you think is the most common misconception? Like what, what is the one thing that you feel like everyone sort of gets confused or gets tripped up on when it comes to, um, you know, self-directed IRAs? Yeah. So I think really a lot of people get scared from self-directed IRAs because they do a little bit of research online and they think that there are all of these restrictions, these things that you can't do. And if you make one little mistake, the entire IRA is just going to really blow up in your face. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the reasons why we like to give a lot of education, not just about IRAs, but the rules as far as, you know, IRS regulations, disqualified people, prohibited transactions. Because once you understand those rules and, you know, once you have access to some decent education about it, it's really not as scary as a lot of people might initially think. Um, it is really important that you do keep your IRA investments separate from your own money and your own investments, but the rules really aren't that complicated. And a lot of people think, you know, it's, you know, I have to be really careful. I can't do anything active, things like that. But the reality of it is, is no matter what niche or knowledge you have as a real estate investor, there is likely a way that you can apply that investment knowledge to your IRA and hold different types of assets in there outside of the usual stock, securities, CDs, kind of things like that. Yeah. And, and so really for mo I mean, there's lots of people I'm assuming that have, <clears throat> you know, a bunch of like old 401k accounts from their prior employers and things like that. I mean, is that one of the overlooked things that people have got money sort of sitting that they could, what, they could roll that over into the uh, traditional IRA account? Is that how it would work or? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's exactly correct. And, you know, we see this all the time. You know, a lot of times people leave a job and there's not really a huge pressing reason for them to move that 401k because only 2% of retirement money in America is actually self-directed. So there's really not a lot of education out there. And your average American honestly has no idea that you can do this. So a lot of times when someone leaves a job and especially after this crazy year that we've had in 2020, um, 
you know, there's a lot of money kind of sitting on the sidelines in that 401k. A lot of times when someone is leaving a job, maybe making those life changes, moving their 401k around isn't really at the forefront of their mindset. Mm -hmm. And they don't really know that they actually have these other options where they can invest it. You know, they think really their only option is to either leave it there or move it to their financial advisor who's going to invest it into the same types of investments. So we meet a lot of people that whenever they kind of learn about what we do and you kind of see it start to click in, in their brain and in their face, um, they think, wow, I wish I would have known about this years ago. And then a lot of times we hear, I also have this 401k that's just been sitting, not really doing anything. Let's, let's make some moves and let's go ahead and put it to work. It's definitely something that we see all the time. Yeah, because I mean, because a person could have, let's say that they, because often what they're going to, they'll usually think that their option is to roll like those 401ks into some like Schwab or Fidelity or TD Ameritrade IRA, right? Is that, that sort of what most people think that that those are my options? Mm -hmm, like, exactly. Put it there and then I can, and then, and that's what you mean by like a financial advisor or something, roll it into yeah. them. So now they've got it. Now they're going to mm -hmm. invest in whatever they want. So exactly. if, but if someone were to do that, it's not like you couldn't have, you know, a, a Fidelity IRA and then, and then move some of that capital or cash into like a Quest Trust IRA, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, is, do people get that confused that it's like you could have, you could have a bunch of different traditional or Roth IRA accounts at multiple custodians. I mean, there's not, I mean, it's, it's obviously that that's sort of an administrative burden, but it's not like you can just have one. Exactly. Yes. And that's another big miss, like common misconception is that a lot of people think it's either one or the other, either I have my funds in an IRA at Fidelity, or I have my funds in an IRA at Quest. But, you know, there's really kind of, like you said, there's no limit to the number of IRAs or retirement accounts someone has. And to be completely honest, a lot of our clients at Quest still have their IRAs at their more traditional custodians, mm -hmm. because no matter where you have your IRA funds invested or held, you want to make sure that your investments are diversified. So a lot of our clients really like the aspect of having the ability to diversify their IRAs into privately held assets, such as real estate. But a lot of times they might just move over what they intend on self-directing because they still wanna keep their money active at least somewhere, even if that means maybe part of it is at Quest, part of it is still at Fidelity. But once your funds are in an IRA, say it's already rolled out of that 401k into an IRA account, you can transfer the cash back and forth between your two IRAs pretty much at any time, as long as they're the same type of IRA. Um, you can transfer funds back and forth at any time, just kind of based on where you're looking to invest it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people don't really realize that yeah. they think it might be one way or the other. And I think it helps to kind of ease their mind a little bit because they realize they don't have to take a risk and send everything over to Quest. They could just maybe take a piece of their retirement funds, move it over here, do an investment, see how it goes. And then in the future, if it goes well and another deal comes across your plate, you can always move more funds over or move it back once the investment closes out. You really actually have a lot of flexibility there. Yeah, that's, yeah. And I think that is, it seems that people get that confused. Like it's just, it, now I'm not sure, maybe we can, maybe you can expound on this. It's just the transferring money from one to the other. Um, I suppose it's just, it's, it ends up being some kind of form so if I have, let's say I go to Fidelity, I've got to figure out what form it is to say, I want to move $50,000 of cash from this to another custodian in this account. And then what they will wire the money and charge me a fee, I suppose, for some transaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, are they, are the bigger custodians, I mean, do they make it difficult to move money or is there any sort of, I mean, I would assume they would, I guess in my own mind, I always think they're going to make everything difficult to get money out. Is, do you guys experience that or? Gosh, yeah, this is a great question. And I love that you brought this up because to be completely honest, it depends. And, you know, Fidelity always comes up as an example, just because they are, you know, one of the largest institutions out there. But if you are we'll kind of take a step back for a second, mm -hmm. if you're moving funds from an IRA at another custodian to your IRA at Quest, 
um, that transaction will be initiated by the custodian that is receiving the funds. Okay. So if you're moving funds into Quest, you'll fill out our transfer form, we'll assist through that process, and then your current custodian will send us the funds. Okay. Likewise, if you happen to be moving funds back to Fidelity, you would actually need to initiate that transfer again through the custodian that is receiving the funds. So it kind of feels a little backwards, but it, hey, I guess it's just the way the process works. Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, that, yeah, that's good clarity. Um, and yeah. it seems in that case, then it's a little, it's a little better because you've got the motivation on the side that wants the funds to be transferred, having the ability to initiate it. And then, you know, I've heard of, and I'm not really sure, this system called like ACAT. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Like it's, there's, there's sort of like a more efficient way for all these things to kind of move back and forth. Cause it's not just, it's not just cash. I mean, you've got assets, right? Like that are held and then transferring those from one custodian to another. My understanding is that some of these, you know, more broker dealer type custodians like Schwab, TD, Fidelity, Pershing, you know, they're like not fans of custodying certain assets like these alts. Mm -hmm. um, but how does that whole world work? Is that is that a differentiator then for firms like Quest? Because I guess the other part of this, not to be like a super long-winded question, but it seems to me that like you guys used to be, you weren't, you weren't like a custodian. At, at, like you said, you were an interest to start with, but there was this notion of self-directed IRA administrators versus a self-directed IRA custodian. So you've mm -hmm. got these different, these distinctions. And then how does it relate to this, the, transferring things back and forth and because I view it as friction it seems like this is the kind of stuff that gets people really frustrated and tripped up is just how much minutia is involved definitely yes and gosh that is a loaded question but I'll do my best to answer it as well as I can but um yeah so as far as moving funds from like one custodian to another um quest is actually a non-acad custodian so where a lot of times if you have an ira at fidelity and you're moving your funds to say e-trade they hold the same types of assets they both only hold publicly traded assets so you know through their kind of acad system they can i guess most times very easily send your cash and your investments from one custodian to another now, in this, I love that you brought this up because this is a good differentiator. At Quest, we only hold privately held assets. A lot of self-directed IRA custodians only specialize in holding uh, privately held assets. Sorry, I think I said privately held assets, yes. Um, so since we hold different types of assets than most custodians out there, only the cash can transfer back and forth from say Fidelity to Quest or Quest to Fidelity. So that is another kind of point where it's important that you do liquidate those investments before you're able to transfer that cash. But as far as that time frame goes, it is totally dependent on where your funds are coming from. If you're transferring from your IRA at Fidelity, we can typically have those funds in as little as three to five business days if you choose to have them wire us the funds. Mm -hmm. Now, some other custodians, not going to name any names here, but a lot of times they will only send a check. They will not wire the funds. We have to mail them the originals of your transfer form instead of you know just faxing a copy of it. And then at that point, they take their sweet time. They take anywhere from three to four, I've even seen it up to six weeks sometimes for funds to arrive from another custodian. So it depends. And, you know, especially if you are looking to, you know, really diversify your funds and you might be considering moving your funds back and forth, um, you want to make sure that your other custodian that you're working with, that their time frame is not going to be something that causes you to lose out on an investment if they have very slow processing times. It just depends. There are some days our transfer team will literally be on hold with a custodian for two hours just to find out the status of someone's incoming funds to Quest. But uh, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, some of those larger ones, typically they're a bit faster to process. Yeah. So when you guys fill out the form and say, hey, we're requesting these funds, they've gotten to the point where it, it's, it, it's a more repeatable I assume what you're kind of saying is that those who are more direct competitors, I mean, because, you know, a Schwab or a Fidelity or, you know, a TD IRA, it's not really a competitive product per se to a Quest Trust IRA account. 
I mean, just mm-hmm. because, like you said, it's like what you can hold. Now, it's not to say you can't hold some of these alts in, you know, one of those other IRAs. It's just it's it's a lot more paperwork, and they're much more selective about. I mean, because let's face it, like this and this is a good sort of segue into it, right? Is that from the custodian standpoint, there's some risk being born, right? Because, and I can see it from the, and I know that it, everyone hates to hear this, and I'm certainly no fan of, you know, the big, the big boy broker dealer custodians, but it, it's just from their standpoint, they know what they're getting when they got, you know, these publicly traded securities. And in, in most cases, right, they're obviously a large holder of these securities to begin with, right? So the way that they trade back and forth from their own account holders. They're held in the name of them. So that's that's all part of their system, how they can operate efficiently. When they have some random private placement or real, you know, like that kind of stuff is just completely different for them. And not knowing who the issuer was and all of the the nuance and variance that that exists inside of that is just it's just it's just friction and 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 comp- complexity, right? And and risk ultimately for them because. They need to know who they're dealing with. Now, with that said, for groups like Quest Trust, how do you guys deal with that? Because you do end up having, you know, a bunch of your clients who are investing into these things that, you know, it just it just seems that since I've been involved in this business since like 2008, it, it just seems a bit to be a moving target as to how you guys as custodians, I'll just, you know, like self-directed custodians view this. Right, like approving whether or not you're going to be willing to hold some asset in custody or not. So what what's what's the deal there? Like, is there really bright lines, or is that where it's just it just depends upon, you know, each custodian? Yes, exactly. And you know, to be completely honest, a lot of those larger custodians, you know, that do specialize in holding those publicly traded assets, if you brought a private placement to them, they sometimes would even tell you you can't invest in this with an IRA. You have to take a distribution if you want to use your IRA to invest into this type of asset because their systems are not even set up to hold those and they don't understand how it works or that it can really even be done for a lot of, you know, even like financial advisors out there have no idea that you can do this. So, you know, we get people that call us sometimes and they're like, my financial advisor told me this is going to be taxable. There's going to be penalties. And we really have to kind of take a second and kind of calm them down a little bit and say, no, you know, you can't actually do this. It's just a transfer. Um, And again, continuing to educate throughout that process. Now, for the second part of your question, this is where it is so important to understand the roles between you as the IRA account holder and your IRA custodian who is administrating your account and your assets. Now, at Quest, we do a lot of webinars, we do a lot of education. At the beginning of every single one of our classes, we always give a disclaimer. And this is so important because at Quest, we are not licensed securities agents. We are not licensed uh, financial advisors. Now I am a CISP, which is a certified IRA services professional, So I'm a nerd and I know a lot about IRAs, but we cannot actually give tax, legal, or investment advice. So whenever we say that our IRAs are self-directed IRAs, they are truly 100% self-directed by our clients. And, you know, that's why I really love what you do. And that's why we do a lot of education because our clients have to be educated about the types of investments that they are choosing to invest in. They need to be educated about the due diligence process and they need to be able to meet other investors as well. So, you know, we host a lot of happy hours. They're a lot of fun, but it's so important for our clients to understand that they need to, you know, do the due diligence on their IRA investments, just like they would any other investment if it was outside of the IRA. Mm -hmm. Now, our role as the custodian is to, you know, administrate the asset, send payments in and out of the account whenever they need to be, whenever our client directs us to do something such as fund an investment, send out a payment. At that point, we process the transactions and we process the paperwork. So, you know, it is really important for investors to have a good custodian, have a good relationship with their IRA custodian, because, you know, like, Obviously, we're here to be educational, but not every self-directed IRA custodian is created equal. Mm -hmm. And as you are getting 
into the world of investing with your self-directed IRA where there are rules, there are certain ways that the IRAs need to be titled. You know, Quest has to sign these documents in certain places and you have to sign off to allow us, for us to sign off. Especially as you are doing this through your first deal, your second deal, you know, first couple times doing this, it's really important that you're working with a custodian who is knowledgeable about the types of investments that you are investing in and that they're knowledgeable and their staff can help to educate you throughout the process as well. Because the more educated our clients are about how they're investing, how they've learned how to do the due diligence and link up with reputable groups, the more confident that they're going to be as they're going out and they're doing these investments and ultimately holding them in their IRA, which you know becomes a win-win situation for everyone involved, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, like that on that that titling and you know I've seen over the years it's just like it seems a bit nitpicky, you know, even with the 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 difference between putting in you know like Quest Trust Company, you know FBO for benefit of and then you know a beneficiary IRA account number right it's like the titling, mm -hmm. and I've noticed that you know it's like now all of a sudden it's it's got to be custodian CFBO for the benefit of. So maybe you can just share like, where's all these little, these little detailed things coming from? You mentioned this whole CISP thing, like mm -hmm. who's dictating these rules? Is it like an IRS thing? Is it like, what, where does this stuff come from that you, that you guys as sort of self-directed IRA custodians, like who is the higher authority here? Like what, what, where, where do the mm -hmm. rules come from? Yes. So, and this also kind of, kind of brings it back to previously Quest was a, an administrator and now we are a true trust company regulated by the Texas Department of Banking. So we are regulated by, um, you know, the TBD Texas Department of Banking where previously, you know, a lot of guy, you guys, if you've known us for a while, you know, we used to be called Quest IRA and now we are Quest Trust Company. So previously in the Quest IRA days, we were a third party administrator and we were actually regulated by Mainstar, who is actually a custodian based out of Kansas. So eventually Quest kind of became so large that the Texas Department of Banking wanted to be able to regulate us in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we took about a year for us to get our trust charter. You know, we've hired a, you know, really awesome compliance officer. She's got several law degrees and has really helped us transition from this role as an administrator to our own trust company. So that has been a really, you know, awesome thing for us. It allows for a lot of opportunities for growth in the future. Um, but as far as like the CISP, that is designated by the American Banking Association. Mm -hmm. And basically to achieve that designation, you have to have worked at an IRA company for at least two years. You take a week long course and then you take like a four hour exam. And it's definitely not easy, um, but it does show that a lot of us that do have the designation of a CISP um, that we've been with Quest for several years. And I would say about a third of our staff actually has that designation. So it's been really cool to kind of see our company grow, but also see a lot of our employees move up through the years, you know, myself included, and really have a lot of tenure in the company because we really stand behind what we do and we really enjoy educating our clients and really like impacting their lives in a positive way by helping them build well through ways that they didn't even know existed a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's these, these sorts of things. I mean, cause my experience having worked, I think we made a list at some point. So as fund administrators, I think that we have, it was over like 50 different self-directed IRA custodians are represented across our entire client base. So, you know, we've, we've sort of seen them all. And I think that the, you know, which I guess it's, it's, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, for the, the layman or the person who's saying, okay, great, this is awesome. All right. I've got a 401k. I want to self-direct it, you know, other than now, you know, having, you know, heard this and, you know, met Haley, right. With Quest Trust, how in the world does someone figure out who to go with, right? Like, so my, my, what my, what it seems to me is, is that people are making decision based upon pricing, right? So, and usually when people decide on price alone, that seems to me that's because they don't really know, 
they're not sophisticated enough of a buyer of the said product. So they just go to the, you know, the one thing they know, which is the almighty dollar. So maybe help us figure out like, how does one determine the difference? I mean, obviously you're, you're biased because you're, you, you know, I'm sure you think Quest Trust is awesome. Um, but like for everyone else, like how, what are the criteria? Like how do you figure mm-hmm. out outside of price who, who you should be doing, you know, choosing is sort of your self-directed IRA custodian? Mm-hmm. I love that you asked this question because, you know, kind of like I mentioned a second ago, not every self-directed IRA custodian is created equally. You know, there's a lot of us out there. Some of, there's a few that are, you know, pretty comparable to Quest, but there's a lot out there that have really terrible customer service. It, I mean, we've even done experiments where we call other IRA companies just to kind of, you know, see how knowledgeable they are, see how quickly they answer the phone. And you want to make sure that you are working with a custodian that understands your needs, that is able to educate you along the way. And, you know, Quest, we are really big on company culture. You know, we answer the phone, how can I make your day? Um, And we really go to great lengths to educate our staff and keep that continuing education going. That way, as our company does grow, and it has grown, you know, over the last several years since I've been here, no matter who you call on the phone, you can get someone that at least has a good base level of education about IRAs and about the customer service aspect of things. And then if you need something a little bit more complicated, you know, speak with an IRA specialist, such as myself or one of the like 15 other IRA specialists that we have on our staff. But we see it all the time where people only look at the fees that a custodian charges and you get the value in what you pay for. There's really, you know, no other easier way to say it. You know, Quest is not the cheapest custodian out there. We're not the most expensive, but we are always driving to improve our processes and make the customer experience that our clients have worth that maybe extra little bit of price that they pay. And it's crazy because like, to be completely honest, overall, the fees that you might pay in a year, the way that they may differ, may be like two to $300, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, depending on how many deals you're doing. But for that difference annually of maybe just a couple hundred bucks of going with a custodian that is really hard to get a hold of, they don't answer their phones, you wait on hold for an hour, and then you end up holding investments with them and you're really not happy about it. And like you kind of mentioned earlier, moving assets from one self-directed IRA company to another It can be done, but it is a process. It takes a couple of months. Everything has to be re-registered. It's not like a stock that can just get shot through the system to the other custodian. So we do see sometimes people wind up in these situations where they're frustrated, they're not having good experiences, and they're holding assets that are now kind of stuck at this custodian that it's, it's really going to be a process to move it. So my piece of advice to you would be, before you open up an account anywhere, before you invest, call someone, get them on the phone, build a relationship with their IRA specialist or whatever comparable they have to someone at their company, and then see what type of education they offer as well. Because if you're not educated about the different types of investments, the process, the timeframes, things like that, you're going to have a much harder time having a good experience investing with your IRA. So call people, get them on the phone, ask questions. You will find just by doing that, some custodians will definitely stand out from others. You know, not just to sit here and be like, Quest is awesome. We are, we we definitely strive to be the best that we can be and we have a good reputation, but no matter who you go with, no matter where you're shopping around, you know, sometimes one might be a little bit more local to you than Quest here in Texas. Hmm. That's okay, but you just wanna make sure that you're going with someone that is going to help you along the process and they're not going to make things like very difficult for you. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. That's sort of how you would, you know. I'm not surprised that that's how you answered it. It, and I can corroborate that. Um, as I said, I have lots of experience dealing with um, self-directed IRA custodians, and um, far and away, I mean, the, the the Quest Trust people are far more knowledgeable and responsive. I mean, and that's. Um, so it's, it's a market difference um, that I've seen. I mean, it's, and like you said, it's not to say that there's, there's some others out there who are pretty good too, I think. And, um, 
but maybe not as like consistent. They're sort of, you, you'll have a few people who are really awesome and then maybe someone who, who doesn't know. And, and maybe that's just a function of how things, you know, go. But um, yeah, I, th I think there is a difference. So it's good to hear that you answer it that way, that it's a commitment. It's a company mm -hmm. thing. It's something you guys sort of strive for. You've made it a priority and it, it certainly comes through in the interactions. Um, and, and also too, I, I think you guys, don't you have like a, you have like a gold program or there's like some higher level, like for people that are very active and making lots of investments. Is that right? There's some other level that you can sort of, I mean, you pay more money for it, but kind of mm -hmm. it's a white glove type service. Is that accurate? We do. Yes. So it's called our gold family plan. And basically for a flat annual fee, you can get like unlimited IRAs for you and your immediate family. The only thing it doesn't cover is if we have to send out a wire, but it, it covers all of your fees in one. And we actually have a um, big shout out to Rebecca Miller. She's awesome. She's one of our longest tenured employees here at Quest. Um, she is our gold family plan liaison. So she is probably one of our most knowledgeable employees. Um, I think she was the like 15th employee at the company, which is really awesome that she's been with us all of those years, but she is a beast. She's awesome. And so we have recently made her our gold family plan liaison where you do get that white glove service. You get everything included in one and you know, it, it makes it easy as you're doing a lot of deals. You don't have to worry about, am I paying the right fee? Should I be switching to something? No, you've just got it all flat annual fee. And you know, we, we make sure all of our clients are taken care of, but we do have that little bit of extra level there for the gold family plan members. Yeah. And then to shift to sort of like the, the, the checkbook control sort of, I mean, do you, do you guys offer that in like, what, what is that? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that what people are doing is, you know, you fund this, this IRA and then that, I, then that IRA ends up investing in some entity. So it basically capitalizes this other entity and then they can have a bank account or something out of that. Is that with the like checkbook control? Is that mm -hmm. part of how it works or? Exactly. Yes. So there are some IRA companies out there that will charge you a couple thousand dollars, set up an LLC for you, provide an opinion letter written by some attorney saying, hey, checkbook control is great. You know, there's nothing wrong or illegal about this, anything like that. Um, and not saying it is illegal by any means, but it's definitely frowned upon in the industry, depending on who you talk to. There are definitely some issues that come up with checkbook control. We're basically with a checkbook control IRA. Um, you know, again, you go to a company, they charge you a whatever fee, and they basically set up an LLC that you are the managing member of, and then your IRA funds into that LLC. And where the issue really lies here is that you, as the IRA account holder, as a what we call a disqualified person to the IRA, there are certain things that you cannot do. You have to make sure that you personally are kept arm's length from your IRA and your IRA transactions. So with the idea of checkbook control, where you as the IRA account holder are the managing member of the LLC that your IRA has funded into, we foresee is definitely problematic. You know, we work with a few attorneys that are very well versed in IRS rules and regulations and IRAs, and even they don't like checkbook control, um, kind of for the same reasons we do, but you know, really providing that service to your IRA and that LLC owned by your IRA could really become a problem. It's easy to get into prohibited transactions in those, you know, they might start cracking down on them in the future. And it can just be played a lot safer if you have your custodian in place that is funding things. And, you know, even if you do want your IRA funded into an LLC, we don't have any problem with that. It's just who is the managing member of that LLC? because you or anyone else who is disqualified to your IRA need to make sure that those investments are kept at arm's length and that you or anyone who's disqualified is not personally benefiting from those investments or providing services to those IRA investments. So just for those reasons, we choose not to hold checkbook control here at Quest, but I will say something that does help 
is we have very fast funding times. Yeah. So a lot of times the reason you want checkbook control is to be able to fund things very quickly, right? Um, we fund things in 24 to 48 hours. It's always going to be that turnaround time there. So it's not immediate. You don't get to write the check yourself. But when you're dealing with your IRA, it is definitely a little bit better to keep yourself a little bit more distanced from those LLCs and those transactions. Yeah, that's kind of what I always thought. I mean, I, I, I get it. And I do think that it, it sort of, for many, was the workaround to just the slow processing time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've, I haven't had the, the chance to visit you guys in person yet, but I, I, you know, I have sort of gone on site to another sizable West Coast based IRA. And I mean, I was astounded by the amount of paper that, you know, is being pushed. Right. Because, and I think that's changed a little bit in the last few years, but I mean, this was when many of you guys still weren't super comfortable with um, electronic signatures and, mm -hmm. you know, that, that hadn't kind of happened yet. And it's just, so you, when you get in, inside of it, you really do see how much administrative burden there is, um, which, you know, but yeah, I think that the checkbook control piece was sort of at that time, it, it was just out of the frustration of, man, we can't get money out of these things and, you know, in a decent time frame. But it does seem like it's just so easy. I know for us as administrators, it's difficult because, you know, the Department of Labor has these, you know, these ERISA limitations on, you know, equity investments. And we got to make sure the threshold, you can't exceed 25%. And so we need to track it. And when you get these checkbook control, you know, entities that come through there, you, you can't tell the difference. It's just an LLC with some random name. Um, it's nondescript, right? But technically its beneficiary is an IRA and, um, you know, and we, and we need to tag them, but we, you know, it, it, we would never know, like, that's the whole, that's a whole nother issue. Like the whole AML, OFAC, KYC stuff, like figuring out, you know, who's behind these things. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it ends up, they're trying to solve one problem. They create a whole nother string of problems, not to mention there's a really good chance that they'll create some prohibited transactions, which could, you know, taint and invalidate really the whole thing. I mean, that's the threat, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that is the reality is that if you conduct a prohibited transaction in your IRA, the whole IRA account, and that could, that wouldn't even just be like the one they hold at Quest, that would be like their whole traditional IRA period. Is, is that, is that accurate? So it is, it actually would just be that particular IRA account that okay. the investment is held in. But another issue here is, is that likely if you do a prohibited transaction in your IRA, the IRS is not going to come knocking on your door tomorrow. They're probably maybe going to catch on in a couple of years. There's no statute of limitations with prohibited transactions and IRAs, which also adds a nice little level there. But basically your IRA ceases to be an IRA January 1st of the year of the prohibited transaction. So if they catch it like two or three or maybe 10 years later, the whole IRA was actually deemed as distributed in the year the prohibited transaction happened. So it can kind of compound some of the fees and penalties. And it's one of the highest like penalized events basically that the IRS has. So, and they do that, you know, to make sure people do play by the rules. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a risk that you want to be aware of, but again, as long as you have the right education, there's just a short list of people that your IRA cannot do certain things with. Other than that, as long as you're not personally benefiting from your IRA investments, there's a whole other world of opportunity of investment options and other people that you can do deals with your IRA with as well. Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch on before I let you go here is the, the whole, the UBTI, um, you know, so if someone uses their IRA, they invest in something where leverage exists Right. So then there's creating some uh, unrelated business taxable income, UBTI. And then in theory, you, you may be subject to pay some unrelated business income tax, which mm -hmm. means that ostensibly the IRA now needs to file a tax return. I mean, they've got to, they basically have to, to do that. So maybe share, shed some light on how that works. I know it scares a lot of people off. Um, and it can be, if the, when the amounts get to be big, if you're generating lots of it, it, it does seem to be quite punitive. But is, you know, how, how do you guys handle that 
with, with people, I mean, that come to you and, and are curious about it. Like what's the, what's the rule of thumb? And is it is really a big of a deal as, as people make it out to be, or what's your take? Yeah. So, and UBIT is one of my favorite topics. It's one of those things that a lot of CPAs are not IRA UBIT experts. And as IRA custodians, we can't give tax advice. So it's one of those weird topics that falls almost right in the middle where not a lot of people specialize in it. And for that and a few other reasons, a lot of investors really get scared when they hear UBIT or they learn about it, kind of things like that. But my piece on UBIT is, you know, it's definitely something to be aware of. And it's something that you do want to take into consideration whenever you are calculating your investment returns and deciding if you want to do this investment or not. But basically, UBIT is a tax within the IRA that can be triggered when your IRA either invests into an ongoing trade or business, or if your IRA invests into debt leveraged property, mm -hmm. either directly, where as your IRA actually purchases a property and gets a non-recourse loan to leverage those funds. Or, you know, what you might see a lot is where someone uses their IRA to invest passively into an LLC or an entity. And then that entity is buying like a large property and they're getting a loan to leverage those funds and leverage that investment. Yep. Now, if that LLC is um, passing like the taxes on to the investors, once the K-1 starts to show a profit of over $1,000, then the IRAs involved in that deal likely at that point will incur UBIT or unrelated business income tax. Mm -hmm. Now, it is definitely something you want to make sure you consult with a CPA who is knowledgeable about UBIT. Um, you know, we've done several educational pieces on it here at Quest, but once your IRA incurs UBIT, it's only on the portion that is debt leveraged. So say if the property is 70% debt leveraged, 70% of the income back to the IRA will now be subject to UBIT. But now that the IRA is subject to this tax, it can use you know, the normal sort of write-offs like uh, expenses, depreciation to minimize the UBIT that the IRA ends up paying. So depending on the deal, depending on the investment, most times by the time you calculate where it's only a percentage of the income and then you can use write-offs to minimize the UBIT, a lot of times it does end up being pretty minimal, but a lot of people get really afraid by this because IRAs are technically like taxed at trust rates, where trust rates hits the top tax bracket very, very quickly. Oh. So it is something to take into consideration, but you know, if you're working with a CPA who is knowledgeable about this, they should definitely be able to help you file that tax form, which is a 990T. Um, and basically your CPA helps you file that. The 990T will show the write-offs and the things like that. And then you send that 990T to your custodian. And then we actually pay that tax from your IRA and it gets sent to the IRS. So like you said, it's, it's basically a tax form that your IRA has to file when it does certain types of investments. Yeah. So, so it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, in, in the evaluation, you, you, you need to look at it so you understand, hey, does it still pencil out, right, a after it? You make the determination that, hey, it's, it's worth it, you know, given the return you're getting. Mm -hmm. And then it really does. And it seems like you said, the missing part is just, it's finding, it's finding a CPA who's well-versed in this and my assumption interpretation of what you're saying is that like this isn't this isn't huge stuff for for them meaning the additional cost to, to prepare the 990t is once again has to be factored into sort of the the, the diligence process or you know uh, mm -hmm. but but then at that point they basically complete the form hand it to you guys you guys pay whatever taxes do out of the account and i suppose there's some fee for you know paying that but it's just at the end of the day to be completely afraid of it out of your own ignorance and not understanding seems it could be short-sighted. Mm -hmm, exactly. You know, I mean, because One, there's other factors, of course, it's just like, hey, this is my retirement money. Do I want to be taking on an investment with that kind of risk and leverage? And you know, that's a whole nother thing. But to not do it because of some 990T tax form. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. yeah. And it's it's really interesting too, because actually something that I learned recently when I, I did an interview with a CPA 
all over UBIT. Um, it was very educational, but I actually learned if you're having your IRA custodial fees deducted from your IRA, that could actually help to you know, be one of the write-offs that could minimize the UBIT that your IRA ends up paying. So if you're having your custodial fees deducted from your IRA, um, at least from what I've been told, yeah. that could also, you know, be a double win there and help minimize uh, your UB uh, unrelated business taxable income that your yeah. IRA ends up paying. Yeah, exactly. So there's, yeah, it, it all comes down to like most things in life. It's just finding the person with the answers to the question is a little bit harder. And, and you guys are in a, it's, you're in a tough spot because you can't, I mean, here we can, you and I can converse about it. Uh, we're not providing, you know, none of this is advice. You guys are just, you know, flies in the wall of our conversation. But, um, but it's hard because when a client comes to you and says, what should I do? It, the answer is like, sorry, I can't help you. And I think that's probably what most people, it scares them off because you're saying, I can't tell you what to do. I mean, we can't, we don't give tax advice and I can tell you what we would do. You fill out this form and you figure it out and then we'll, we'll file it. But they're going, how in the world do I fill out the form? Who do I go to? Their CPA is like, I don't know. I've never heard of it. You know, they're basically, it's a non-starter. So um, yeah. yeah, it's always a fun topic, but but I think, I think that shows you, right, is that this is where getting into this space and putting money and self-directing it. I mean, obviously, I'm a big fan of it. You know, we've got, you know, the Veravest sponsor directory where you've got, you know, all sorts of options now to go and find people that are doing deals and, and you know, things to invest in. And, um, but, yeah, having and working with a group that has knowledgeable people, I think, is really the... That's the big differentiator because it, it it can get and it and it is and there's no doubt about it. It can get frustrating. It's sometimes counterintuitive, what all these rules come from and those things. But but certainly worth, I think, the efforts of understanding it because the power of it. You hear of some people, and I'm sure you guys got great stories of just people mm -hmm. have grown their IRAs to like you know six you know high six digit seven digit you know IRA accounts right like mm -hmm. like crazy. That's all tax, you know, non-taxable. Yeah, so. definitely. And it's actually really funny, you know, like I was mentioning in the beginning, my parents have been Quest clients for a long time. Um, when I started working at Quest, I looked up, I was like, what do my parents hold in their IRAs? You know, what, what do they have in there? I was just really curious about it. And I was really shocked because I really don't think that you can grow an IRA through the traditional means of investing stocks and CDs. You know, you might make good returns in the stock market, but at the end of the day, you have no control over it. Whereas you have these other options, or if you just do like maybe one or two real estate deals a year in your IRA, compound that over the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's amazing how much more you can grow an IRA through investments that are actually tangible, more secure, and that you have more control over where that money is invested or who it's invested with. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I'm really passionate about what we do. I've seen it in my own life. I've helped a lot of our clients, you know, realize the potential. And it's, it's not like I'm out here like selling couches, you know, or yeah. I'm actually, we're making a big difference in people's lives. And it's really fun to be a part of that. Yeah, most definitely. Cool. Well, where can people find uh, you, Haley? I mean, we've mentioned Quest Trust a bunch of times, but what's the, what's the official way to find you and, and get in touch? Yes. So to be honest, our website is a great resource, uh, questtrust.com. There you can find all of our events. You can find our contact information. You can actually chat live with an IRA specialist directly through our website during our business hours. Um, but if you guys have questions, uh, send me an email. That email that I'll include here is IRA specialists at questtrust.com. So again, the website is questtrust.com and that email address is IRA specialists at questtrust.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. I'll see you later. All right. Take care.